pressure-free prayer. We've been talking about prayer and what it looks like, and, you know, it's interesting, uh, you look at how the world has couched prayer. I think of the film uh, Meet the Fockers and Greg Focker. Maybe you remember his prayer. Maybe you've seen a clip of it. Maybe you saw the film and remember him seated at the table with a family that he hardly knows and he's asked to pray and he's got all this verbiage and he's highly uncomfortable. He's trying to plug in the formula and sound right. He addresses God as the Lord of hosts and he uh, sort of butters up God at the beginning and then by the end of the prayer, uh, he's trying to rhyme. He's stuck naming three things that are so great about God and three requests that he asks of the Lord of hosts and on and on it goes. He's found himself trapped in this prayer at the dinner table when all he's trying to do is impress the family of his girlfriend. I mean, the way that the world has portrayed prayer, it's awkward and weird, even hilarious at times. And if we're not careful, we end up looking at prayer the same way. I don't know about you, but I, I grew up with a lot of pressure about prayer. And that's what we've been seeing in this series. We've already asked questions like, should I pray in tongues? And what is praying in the Spirit? And how do I do it? And am I praying enough? And maybe I should be more demanding in prayer. We've got all these questions, and I don't know if you remember the, the answers, but fortunately there are solid answers to these questions. Should I pray in tongues? Paul is saying, no, pray with your mind. Pray with understanding. Pray so that other people can hear you and say amen and agree with it because they get it. What is praying in the Spirit? Remember, that's not some magic formula. That's not praying with some burst of energy. That's not praying in a foreign language. That's not praying in a, in a heavenly, angelic tongue. Praying in the Spirit is just praying with the confidence that you're in the Spirit. You've got the best seat in the house. You're raised and seated in heavenly places. You're close to God. You're in union with Christ you're one with him. And this was a big deal. Lastly, we saw, you know, this idea of am I praying enough and should I be more demanding? I mean, the implication is that you're going to be heard because of your frequency. That you're going to be heard because you're more demanding. That you're knocking down God's door to get what you want. And remember that even... When we don't know how to pray, haven't you found yourself in that situation? When you don't know how to pray, the Bible tells us God prays for you. And that's incredible to think about. So should we be demanding of God? Remember how Jesus prayed. He said, uh, all right, you know what? Let this cup pass. That's my request. If there's a plan B instead of the cross, I'll take it. So first, he was being real. But second, he was saying, not my will, but your will be done. So there was a let, but there was also a yet. Do you remember this beautiful balance we saw? Let this cup pass. Give me another option. I really want out of this if possible. If there's another way, show it to me. Yet, at the end of the day, not my will, but your will be done. And that beautiful balance right there, it takes us away from that health-wealth gospel that is nonsense. It also takes us away from that passivity of not being willing to talk to God, thinking, well, prayer doesn't matter. Uh, prayer doesn't do anything. Prayer doesn't work. We could fall into a passivity of not talking to God. And we could also fall into this demanding state of trying to convince him and talk him into stuff. And right there in the middle is this beautiful balance. It's the let and it's the yet. Let this cup pass. God, I want my circumstances to change. Maybe you're unhealthy. You've got 
some illness you're struggling with. Maybe you're in a marriage that's really rough. Maybe you've got circumstances that haven't changed in months or years. And you don't want to fake it. You want to say, God, I want out of this. I want change. I'm being real with you, Lord. And that's good. As long as at the end of the day, we're talking to him with open hands saying, you know what? You run the universe and I don't. So we continue our series talking about prayer. And I just want to share with you a formula for prayer that I grew up with. Now, this was something that was taught to me when I was a teenager in youth group. And maybe you've heard of it. It's a, an acronym, A-C-T-S. And it stands for Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, and Supplication. And man, when I first heard this, I thought, this is it. I mean, I was taught this is the be-all and end-all, the way that you communicate with God, and it goes a little something like this. We start with adoration. And what we do is we essentially butter God up. We tell Him He's awesome, and then we get ourselves pure with confession. And then we thank God for all the stuff He's already given us. And then lastly, you know what we do? We hit Him up for the new stuff. We hit Him up for the new stuff that we want from Him now. Now, while this sounds kind of spiritual and it's like a, a formula to follow if you don't know how to pray otherwise, at the end of the day, do you see what we're doing? I mean, imagine... Imagine your own child comes to you and says, hey, uh, dad, first I want to say, uh, you're, you're the greatest dad in the world. There's no other, no other dad that's better than you. You're incredible. You know, my first thought after hearing that, yeah, just tell me what you want. <laughs> just tell me what you want. But you see how we have gotten ourselves into a mode where we believe that we need a formula to talk to dad. Imagine a human relationship where you just have this formula, this acronym that you work your way through, and part of it is a purification ritual, and then part of it is positive thinking and, and being thankful, and then the last part is, give me more stuff. Here's what I really want to talk about. And so when we get ourselves in a mode like this, it actually feeds the pressure. I mean, you know, it feeds the idea that that we just can't be ourselves. We can't talk to God for real. We can't just lay it out there on the line and just let it be. We need formulas and rituals and repetitive prayers and memorized prayers and ways to access God. It's almost like we're, we're trying to reenact that Verizon commercial. You know what I'm talking about? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Uh, maybe if I rephrase it, can you hear me now? And so we buy into the false notion that if we just say it differently or do it differently, we'll finally, we'll finally get what we want. Because isn't that the goal? It seems like in all of that, that's the goal. I want to get what I want, so show me how to get what I want. And you know, you look back at the prayer of Jesus, open-handed, his attitude was not, give me what I want. And when we realize, that's not what prayer is about. Prayer is not about a formula to get what you want. Prayer is about getting in tune with what the God of the universe wants for you. And it's always good. In fact, it's better than you could ask for or imagine. So sometimes we don't know what to ask for. And I, I don't know about you, but I'm kind of okay with that at this point. I'm tired of asking for what I think I need. And lately, as I shared earlier, I mean, I've been saying, God, would you pray for me today? Pray for me today. Discuss me. And we were saying last week, isn't it beautiful how the Trinity discusses you? That you are dinner table conversation among the Trinity. I, I think that's amazing. When we don't know how to pray, the Spirit prays for us. Who does He pray to? Well, he prays to the Father, he prays to the Son. The entire Trinity is happy to discuss you. And isn't that cool to know that you are prayed for all the time? 
And even when you don't have a friend or a buddy praying for you, the God of the universe prays for you with groanings that are too deep for words, asking for things that you don't even know how to express. That's pretty incredible to think about. So what I want to do today is I want us to visit two very powerful prayers in the book of Ephesians, not for the purpose of imitating them. The first one in Ephesians chapter 1, but not for the purpose of trying to imitate them, but rather for the purpose of seeing what is the heart of God. I would ask you, if God is praying for you, what is he praying? Is he praying for that new car? Is he praying for a new house? Is he praying for something materialistic, something that uh, is on planet Earth that's a circumstance change? Well, maybe. I'm not going to say he's not. But I think there is something deeper that God prays for you. When the Trinity discusses you, it's deeper than different circumstances. And so today, as we look at two different prayers given to us by the Apostle Paul in the book of Ephesians, we're going to gain some insight, not into magic words to get what you want. That's not what this is about. It's really about if this is inspired scripture and these are prayers within that scripture, then apparently this is a little glimpse into daddy's heart for you. So let's talk about this because I don't know about you, I, I'm tired of the grocery list. I'm tired of prayers that feel like a laundry list of things that I'm begging and pleading for with a little in Jesus name tacked on the end. I want to know what God is thinking. I want to know what he's up to. I want to know what he's most excited about so that I can enter into that and get it better and celebrate it with him. So let's jump into Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. For this reason, I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus which exists among you and your love for all the saints... He says, I do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. So first, we're just getting ready to see this prayer. I mean, there's a description of this prayer that apparently Paul has been praying and he's been phrasing it different ways, but it's been on his heart for some time and it relates to giving thanks for the body. Thank you, God, that I'm not alone. Thank you that I'm surrounded by people who are in Christ just like me. Thank you that I don't have to be a Lone Ranger Christian. And thank you that there's a sincere love in the body of Christ that is different than the world. So, you know, it's interesting because the way we approach prayer, uh, we don't always approach it to looking to give thanks. And it's not that it's magical that we need to be in positive thinking and it's just going to recharge us if we speak it. But there is something healthy about giving thanks for the body of Christ and giving thanks for the people in your life. Maybe the people in your family are believers or maybe this is your only family in Christ right here in this congregation. I don't know your situation, but looking to your right and looking to your left, there are people around you that care about you. And if you need to test that, I would encourage you to reach out when you're in trouble and let us know how we can help and counsel and comfort and guide you into your next step in life. We really are here for you and the body of Christ is here for you. But there's a, there's a peace in knowing that you're not alone. And I think that can be expressed. Father, show me my friends. Show me the people that care about me Give me eyes to see those who are in Christ that I'm connected to. Thank you, Father. I'm not going to believe the enemy's lie that I'm alone in this world. Paul goes on that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. I've been praying for better circumstances, haven't you? I mean... I've been praying for, uh, well, getting better from illness, getting better from physical conditions that I struggle with. I've been praying for uh, 
different situations, whether it be financial or physical or in my family and among my friends. I've been praying for circumstances to change. Most of my Christian life, I've been praying about those kind of things. And we don't need to feel bad about that. We should feel good that we get to say whatever comes to mind. But again, what is God's heart here? Look at this. It is the wisdom and revelation of the knowledge of Him. So what if I started including in my prayers, Father, I just I want to know Jesus and all that it means to know Jesus. I mean, I know Jesus, but I want to know Jesus. I know Jesus, but I want to know what it is to know Him in the fellowship of suffering in the power of his resurrection, in the reactions to other people, in the way I treat people, in the way I respond, in the way I am in my family, raising my kid, uh, being a husband, being a spouse. I want to know Jesus in the midst of those things. He indwells me. So what does it mean for him to be expressed? Him to be expressed at work and at school and in my home life. I want to know Jesus in everything. You know, God, that thing I've been struggling with, the thing where I can't seem to find an answer, I keep responding poorly, I feel like a a rat going down the same uh, channel of the maze over and over, and I just keep getting electrocuted. I keep getting burned over and over, the same reactions that don't work, and it's driving people apart. God, I want to know you in that. I want to know your peace, I want to know your joy, I want to know your love and your kindness, I want to know how to express Jesus, I want the knowledge of Jesus in this situation. Have you prayed prayers like that? Jesus, show me you in this, even in this, I want to know you most of all. Paul says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know What is the hope of his calling? What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? So I I don't know about you, but sometimes I've prayed things and I hear nothing. Have you ever prayed something and you hear nothing? It's just like crickets. There's an absolute silence. The only thing you hear is the rumbling of your own tummy. And so we can get frustrated. God, why aren't you speaking? And, you know, it kind of reminds me of the walkie-talkies, you know, the ones we had as kids. Uh, You're trying to plug in the right formula, and you're trying to push the button at the right time, and you're talking when they're talking, and you can't hear because you got the button pressed instead of letting go. And we're just trying to make this interaction between heaven and earth work. God, where are you? What are you saying? Why is it so quiet? What are you doing in the silence? And when we look at what Paul is saying here, I guess maybe I I need to consider that the answer has already been given, but I just need to understand it better. But if I know the answer has already been given, that kind of matters, right? We call it the finished work of Christ. What if sometimes the answer to your prayer is the finished work of Christ? Then God would just be saying the same thing over and over again, But it would be so deep that you could never get to the end of it. The answer to your prayer would be so deep that you could never exhaust it. So what do I mean by that? What am I even talking about? Well, verse 18, as I mentioned, it says that you would know a few things. The hope of his calling. So there's a calling inside of you. You've been given an assignment as the child of God that you are. You've been branded a child of God, your heart of stone taken out, given a new heart, you have a new calling, a new purpose, but if you don't know it, then it's really hard to enjoy it. I mean, if you don't know who you are, how can you relax and enjoy Him? Secondly, there's something here at the very end of verse 18 that's pretty profound. He's saying, I want you to know the riches of of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Boy, that's a mouthful. (laughs) It is, honestly, isn't it? And it could just be a hodgepodge of spiritual gobbledygook if we are not careful. I mean, 
what is he saying? Well, first, what's an inheritance? An inheritance is when somebody dies and they leave it to you. So who died? Jesus died. He left an inheritance. Where is it? Oh, it says right there, it's in the saints. The inheritance is in the saints. I'm always thinking about an inheritance in heaven. He's talking about an inheritance that is in the saints. So what's the problem? Why is he praying? He's praying not that there would be an inheritance. He's praying that we would see it. That we would see how big the riches of this glory really are in us. Right here, right now. I need to know my value. Uh, the world doesn't value me. The world measures you. They judge you according to your family name. They judge you according to your wealth, your social status. They judge you according to what you do for a living. Uh, they judge you as a VIP or a not-so-VIP according to certain standards. We call that the flesh, your resume in the world. But God looks at you according to this inheritance, the rich inheritance that you have in you. But if you don't know that, then you're out there hunting for VIP status. You're always trying to be important to other people. You're always trying to be something. And what the gospel does for you is you start realizing, I am a VIP by nature. In God's kingdom, the most important measure of all I measure off the charts the righteousness of God, 10 out of 10. There, are, uh, there is a rich inheritance inside of me, and I just need to get to know that. So here, here's what I'm challenging you to think about. When's the last time you prayed, God, show me my inheritance. God, show me my heritage. God, show me my lineage. God, show me my heart. Show me that I'm actually good in you. Show me Jesus in me. Show me who I am in Jesus. Reveal to me. I've been praying about cars and houses and jobs in the future and nothing wrong with that, God. You're my dad and I get to be real. But I'm actually learning that there are some deeper things that I can bring up with you. And so, Father, I'm praying that you would show me who Jesus is and what it means to express him and know him and trust him and rely on him in the darkest hours is this real is this christianity thing real i mean if it is if this christianity thing is real then it goes beyond forgiveness it goes beyond heaven and it means that all that stuff about christ in me is real right here right now either the whole thing's a farce or the whole thing's real I mean, this Christ in you stuff, wow. I mean, can you imagine if this stuff is real, what it actually impacts every area of our lives? So, Father, I'm praying, I'm praying that you would show it to me so that I could be even further convinced. That's the kind of thing Paul is saying here. Verse 19, and what is the boundless greatness of his power toward us who believe. And so we see he says these are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Now I know that I'm a human like you and I could read these verses and they could just sound like a lot of platitudes. Okay, I mean, Christ raised from the dead, seated at the right hand of God. That's Jesus, and that's awesome. I mean, so what? <laughs> I'm still asking, what about me? What about me? How does that impact me? I mean, it's great that Jesus rose from the dead. Well, as you keep reading in Ephesians, what you find is that Paul says, Christ was raised so that he could carry you up with him. Christ was raised from the dead, and he took you up with him. And so Paul's prayer is, show me where I am. In fact, he's praying for the Ephesians. This is not selfish. Paul wants the church to see this. Paul wants you to see this. God wants you to see this. When's the last time you said, God, show me what it means that I'm raised and seated? God, show me 
what it means that I got lifted up with Christ and that I'm seated right next to you. You know, it's not a long distance phone call. Prayer is local because Christ lives in you, but also prayer is local because you're seated in heaven. Christ is in you. Heaven has come to earth, but earth has gone to heaven. You are seated right next to God. So when you talk to God, you know, Paul called it praying in the spirit. You might also call it praying while seated right next to dad. Praying while seated in perfect proximity. And I know we get the silence. We hear the crickets. We hear the rumble of the stomach and nothing more. We want big answers, sky riding in the sky, circumstances changed, mountains moved. I'm just saying that sometimes in the silence, the answer is the finished work of Christ. The cross has spoken. The resurrection declares something. Sometimes God's answer is look to what I've already done Sometimes God's answer is, I've already taken care of this, just get to know all that I've provided. And that's okay, this is not a name it, claim it, this is just a fact. Whether you claim it or not, God has done some powerful things through the cross and the resurrection. Let me give you some examples. Let's say that you're struggling with loneliness, and so you pray for friends. Maybe you pray for friends for uh, a month, a year, a decade. And maybe friends come and go, but you can't see a clear path forward where God has just blessed you with an abundance of three or five or ten friends. And so, what do you do? Do you declare there is no God? What do you do? Do you declare that He doesn't answer prayer? Do you declare that all those things about God providing, that God is now a liar because he didn't come through for you? Well, friends may come and go, but what if, what if God wants you to learn the deepest lesson of all? That it's great to give thanks for the body of Christ, and it's awesome to have believing friends, but what is the true cure to loneliness? What is the true cure for the problem? And if God is loving and God is good, wouldn't he want you to know that? And so ultimately, what is it that he's showing us? He's showing us that we are in perfect union with him. We'll never be abandoned. We're never alone. We're always in Christ. Christ is always in us. If he is for us, who can be against us? And I'm not saying that we go off on some island with some sort of superficial Gnostic type thought of, you know, all, all I need is the spiritual. No, we are physical and we are emotional and we need conversation and we need friends. But I am saying that there is a deeper answer to all of our needs and that answer has already been provided. Sometimes you're praying for something, waiting for the response, and the response is the finished work of Christ. Does that make sense? So my hope and prayer this morning is that you would be encouraged that when you hear silence, sometimes the answer is what Jesus has already done. All right, let's look at this second prayer as we conclude uh, this is a very famous uh, prayer. This one is quite often taught in churches around the world. We'll take just a few minutes with it. Paul says, I bend my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. And so we see there that we have a family name and we're in the family of God. And you're talking about a, a pedigree. You're talking about, you're talking about a um, a lineage and a heritage, well, there it is. We have a heavenly identity and a heavenly heritage. He goes on, he says that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner self. All right, so what is he praying for so far? God, I want to be strengthened. I want them to be encouraged and strengthened. I mean, he comes right out with it. Hey, Paul, wh where's your formula? 
Where's the ACTS? Where's the purification ritual? Where's the, the plug-in formula where you got to push the button at the right time and fire up your prayer and get what you want? Paul's not into that. He's saying, hey, you guys are weakened. You guys need to be strengthened. Let's just pray for what we need. Father, I want to be strengthened, and I ask that they might be strengthened by the Holy Spirit in the inner self. Notice, this is not asking for more of the Spirit. Recently, I got a, a phone call on the radio program, and someone was sharing their thoughts about difficulty and trial, and they said, we got to invite the Spirit. And I said, hang, hang on, I hear you, I hear the heart of what you're saying. We want the Spirit involved. We want the Spirit to counsel and guide us. But as far as getting the Spirit, maybe that's not what you mean, but as far as getting more of the Spirit, we don't need to invite the Spirit because we've already got the Spirit in the inner self. What we do need is to be strengthened by the Spirit. You know, one time a few years back, I had a Pepsi bottle up here and it was a, a big two liter bottle and it had a cap on it real tight and I shook it up and you know what happened? Well, there was no more Pepsi entering the bottle. There was no more liquid going in. But on the inside, all that Pepsi got stirred up. And it started to fizz up toward the top. So that's the kind of thing that Paul is talking about here. We don't need more of the Spirit. But we need to be strengthened by the Spirit that is already living in us. So let him fizz up, if you will... Let him be active on the inside, giving you strength. Verse 17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Wow, this is an eloquent prayer. I mean, you could be in intimidated by it if you're not careful. Are we trying to look at the verbiage and imitate it? Are we trying to say what Paul said and pray what Paul prayed? That's not really the goal here. That's not really what's going on here. What we're doing here is we're saying, hey, do you see the topic? I mean, just look at what he prays for. I want you to know how gigantic the love of God is. I want you to be strengthened by the power of God's love. It's not selfish. So you see these prayers in Ephesians, and they tell us a great deal. I mean, they tell us that when we pray, let's pray in the new way. Let's pray in the new covenant way. Let's be real. Let's also be open-handed. Let's ditch formulas. Let's recognize that we don't approach God in some sort of robotic or formulaic manner. Let's be transparent and real, talking to Him about circumstances. But I would call your attention to the deepest of prayers. How can I say they're deeper? Well, because they're about Jesus. That's why. How many times are we praying about Jesus how many times are we looking to know Jesus in a certain situation and asking God to reveal Jesus in that? Show me your love. Show me my inheritance. Show me the riches that are in the saints. Show me your love among those around me. But most of all, show me your love as it dwells within me. I want to be strengthened by your grace. I want to be strengthened by your goodness. I want to believe you even more than I did yesterday. Convince me. Go ahead and talk me into it. Talk me into your great love. And when we hear the silence in response to that, don't be discouraged because it is not silence. 
The cross speaks. The resurrection declares that the answer to many of our prayers has already been provided. Christ in you. The riches of His glory in the saints. Get to know who you are in Him. Get to know who He is in you. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for circumstances that change. We thank You for good health. We thank You when we are provided for materially. We, we thank You that we have a roof over our heads. We have uh, clothes on our back. We thank You for material things. We are grateful for those things. We thank You when our kids do well, when our kids are healthy, and we thank You when our family is safe. We're grateful for all these things. We really, really are. Yet we want to go deeper with you in understanding your heart for us. What are you praying? When you, the Trinity, when you discuss us, what is the topic? Where do you have us headed? What's on your heart and your mind? Father, that's what we want to connect with. We want to know your agenda. And today, Father, we've seen you want us... You want us to know your presence. You want us to know your power. You want us to believe you. You want us to know your love. You want us to know that the cross has spoken, that the resurrection has declared your glory and your goodness and your kindness toward us, that you're for us, not against us. We thank you for your support, for your counsel, for your presence, for your guidance. We thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray, amen.